guys. Um, thank you very much for everybody um, for having me along tonight. So we're going to do a quick presentation tonight, about 50 minutes on waking the Baltic giant was aircraft carrier Raf Zeppelin. So today we're going to be looking at the story of how I helped to wake the Baltic giant, Hitler's aircraft carrier from Zeppelin. I'd like to begin by introducing you to an important character in our story, Kriegsmarine veteran August Brunmeier, or as he liked to be known, Gust. A veteran of the Graf Zeppelin, Gust is perhaps best placed to share the wartime story of Hitler's only aircraft carrier. And so I'm going to share some of the narrative tonight as seen through Gust's eyes. Many of the images used in the presentation are from his personal collection, and I'm eternally grateful for him for giving me permission to use them. Following a trip to the cinema in 1940, during which they played newsreel footage of the Kriegsmarine's big ships, um, Gus decided to enlist straight away and join the Navy, age just 17. His parents pleaded with him to finish his apprenticeship as a miller, rather than follow a fancy of running away to sea. Advice I think that most parents would give to their parents even today. But he was absolutely adamant that he was leaving his native Austria for Kiel, a decision that may well have saved his life. As a result of a milling accident in which he had lost a fingertip, he wasn't considered A1 fighting fit. This was very early on in the war, and Germany had had its pick, had its pick of healthy young men. So he'd be sent to be an anti-aircraft gunner, stationed at the end of a pier in Kiel Harbour. And according to Gus, this was one of the safest positions he, he could have been, been posted to, because as being a flat gunner, he was naturally outside of the city, so away from all of the bombing, though he did get ringside seats to watch it every night. This image is from Gus's personal collection, and the trace around whistling through the night sky over Kiel give a good idea of the sort of scenes that Gus was experiencing as a young man. He witnessed and participated in intense anti-aircraft fire over Kiel, but explained that he never actually knew he hit anything because they didn't aim at targets they were seeing, but rather would receive orders from a nearby command post, and they would simply just discharge their weapon into a, a sector of sky that they were told to shoot into. He did, of course, realise that there were clearly casualties and he may have even caused some of them. During World War II, over 8,300 RAF Bomber Command aircraft would be lost and in excess of 57,000 aircrew would lose their lives. And let's remember that these things don't include losses by Coastal Command, Fighter Command or the Fleet Air Arm, all of whom took quite significant losses also. It was regular targeting of the occupied French harbour of Brest by, by both Bomber Command and Coastal Command aircraft that would bring Gust his lucky break and an opportunity to fulfil his, his dream of serving on a capital ship when, in 1941, he was transferred to the heavy cruiser Prinz Eugen in anticipation of the Channel Dash or Operation Cerberus, as the Germans knew it. Gust would be there to provide additional anti-aircraft firepower on board the ship as it raced through the English Channel in early 1942, heading for waters near to home and away from Brest, which at the time was one of the most heavily bombed places on Earth. Bogus loved his time in Prince Eugen, very much considered himself a Prince Eugen man for sure. He, he would all too soon be sent back to his anti-aircraft position here on the end of this pier in Kiel. And you can see he's actually right in the distance there, where that green X is, that, that was his position. And no doubt this was a disappointing posting for him, but things could have been a lot worse. Because history shows that by 1942, Nazi Germany was already running into into problems. And Gus's friends and peers who he'd left at home in Austria finishing their apprenticeships and just waiting to be drafted into the armed forces would ultimately all be herded into the army and all of them would die on the Eastern Front, as did his own brother. But I promised this would be a story about the Graf Zeppelin. So here we go. The Allies have been regularly flying over naval bases both in Germany and the occupied parts of Europe in order just to keep track of where German naval assets were located. The Graf Zeppelin was no different. Her position was well documented and numerous reconnaissance pictures of her still exist. Here she's seen in early 1940, fitting out um, in Kiel. So she's, she's, she's been launched um, in, in 38 and you know, they're, they're finishing off all of the bits and bobs on deck and installing the machinery um, that would turn her into a fighting ship. When this picture was taken, she was about 90% complete and was scheduled to start sea trials later that year. And had this schedule been maintained, she would have been operational in time to sail with Bismarck in May 1941. But of course, Graf wasn't completed, and in early 1940, all work was suspended. 
The logic for stopping work, and it was due to the fact that most thought the war would be short-lived, and so she would not be completed in time to take part. Also, let's not forget that no one had experience in operating an aircraft carrier in combat at this time, as there's some hard lessons were still to be learned on all sides, in, right, in fact. So in July 1940, right before the 17-year-old Gus first arrived in Kiel, Graf Zeppelin would leave Kiel, relocate into Gdynia in occupied Poland, or Gothenhaven, as the Germans called it. Graf Zeppelin, whose engine room machinery was installed but not yet commissioned, were pulled across the Baltic by tugboats. And as we can see in this archive document, her move didn't go unnoticed. And, long, and before long, she was relocated by RAF reconnaissance in Gdynia. At this point of the war, Poland was pretty much out of range of Allied bombers based in the UK. And so the move would spare the ship unnecessary damage and give the Allies one less reason to bomb Kiel itself. But by March 1942, with the war now well into its third year, and with the recent success of the Kriegsmarine in cooperation with Luftwaffe, in bringing Prince Eugen, Gneisenau and Scharnhorst through the English Channel, right under the noses of the British, with the aid of Gus, of course, Grand Admiral Raider, head of Kriegsmarine, informed Hitler that the Navy needed an aircraft carrier. And Hitler himself would declare that the carrier should be completed in the shortest possible time in view of the vital importance of such a unit, necessitating the ships move back to Kiel for the necessary work to be undertaken. And so this is where Gus arrives in the story of Graf Zeppelin. In November 1942, without any indication as to where he would be going, Gus was ordered to Kiel Railway Station. In November 1942, in Kiel stationiert by the flag, and there were then einmal together, it was 120 to 150 men, and up ging's with the Zug Richtung Osten. We had no Ahnung, was anliegt. Kamen nach Gotenhafen, wurden dann einquartiert auf dem Schiff Monte Olivia, das war ein großes Passagierschiff. In der Ferne sahen wir den Flugzeugträger zum ersten Mal und haben gestaunt über die Größe, über warum wir hier sind, wussten wir noch nicht. Und auf einmal hieß es auch einsteigen in den Schlepper. Und der Schlepper brachte uns dann zum Flugzeugträger. Und dann hat es geheißen, wir sind hier am Flugzeugträger. Wir müssen hier, die Geschütze waren montiert, Vierlingsflagge und drei Zentimeter Doppellaufetten. Und wir müssen jetzt die Munition klar machen. Und der Flugzeugträger wird abgeschleppt nach Kiel. Gus would be stationed on this weapon here. And once familiar with the ship, he was amongst the group that was sent to shore, a group that was sent to shore and travelled inland to an ammunition dump to pick up um, ammunition for the Graf Zeppelin's trip back to Kiel. And it was anticipated that she would be working up in the Baltic by mid-1943, with a view to joining perhaps Turpitz or Scharnhorst in 1944. Together, these ships would have formed a powerful battle group. Upon returning from the ammunition dump, the gunners would have had to individually load hundreds of magazines for their weapons. And this is what we see the men sitting here on the deck, on the flight deck, doing. Once loaded, the, the magazines were stored in armoured lockers, such as the one here in the background. Some of which remain on the wreck today. Now, of course, Graf Zeppelin didn't fail to make an impression on Gus. At over 262 metres long, she was the longest ship in the Kriegsmarine and was unique in having four propeller shafts. She also had more horsepower than any other ship in the Kriegsmarine, 200,000 uh, 200, horsepower in fact, double that of Britain's Out Royal, and giving her more horsepower than any other ship in Europe at that time. She was tall as well, standing 22 and a half metres from keel to flight deck. Pretty damn big. And so in December 1942, she began her journey back to Kiel under the code name Zander, in homage to Captain Zander, who had laid the foundations to German naval flying back in the 1920s. Zander was also the code name I chose for, for, for my project to research a Graf Zeppelin, as, like all people researching some kind of wreck, I was absolutely paranoid that if I mentioned the ship's name out loud, someone would steal the idea and beat me to it. On this journey, she would again be pulled by tugs. Um, but it was hoped that, that the work carried out in Kiel would soon allow us to steam under her own power and to belatedly start working up in the Baltic, perhaps with Gus as a permanent crew member. The return journey was uneventful, 
and took just a few days. But the fact that Germany felt the need to arm the vessel for this trip um, through the one body of water, in theory at least, they had aerial superiority over. And the speed um, is testimony to, to Allied aerial superiority as it was growing throughout the course of the war. And the speed with which aircraft development was progressing. In 1940, when she first moved to Cadenia, as far as we can tell, she had made the journey unarmed. So no, no serious airborne attack could have been made against her uh, in that location. But by 1942, attack at any time in any location was possible, and so they just had to be prepared for anything. Gus recalled how much work still, still needed to do on board the ship to bring her to full battle readiness. They did have access to, to functioning wash and toilet facilities, and some of the galleys, such as this one, were able to provide them with hot food for the journey. However, as can be seen in this picture of the bread ovens, there's clearly some equipment still absent. So take, take a look at the wall. Um, behind the chap in the picture, and you can see markings indicating the locations where equipment is yet to be installed. On arrival at Kiel, Gav Zeppelin entered a 40,000 ton floating dry dock to have a modification made to a hull in order to correct a four and a half degree list of pour the ship had developed due to a calculation error by our designers. The modification would not only correct the list, but would also significantly extend the range and give her added protection from torpedo attacks, so-called counterpoise bulges, serving as fuel bunkers, but also to absorb the impact of torpedoes. Bringing the ship to Kiel was part of a belated plan to finish the carrier, but in reality, Germany had really missed an opportunity. No sooner had she arrived than the future would once again be called into question when, at the start of 1943, Grand Admiral Raider and Hitler had an argument in which Hitler ordered a decommissioning of the larger naval units, prompting Raider to resign. Though initially there was consideration of completing Graf Zeppelin and turning all of the larger capital ships into aircraft carriers, a situation I've got sneaking suspicion Hermann Goering was behind. A lot of people don't realise uh, the, 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 the Luftwaffe operated quite a lot of ships as well, especially catapult ships. Raider's successor would ultimately decide to retain all of the capital ships as they were as fighting units, but he would cease all further work on Graf Zeppelin. And just months later, in fact, by April of the same year, Graf Zeppelin would be again on the tow on a penultimate journey heading back to Poland and a branch of the River Oda just outside Stettin. Graf Zeppelin couldn't remain in Kiel. She would just draw too much unwanted attention from bomber aircraft. It's worth noting just how visible these large assets were to reconnaissance aircraft. Now, I love, particularly love this image from, the 1940, but from 1940. There's just so much detail. But also, it's easy to see how hard it is to hide a, a big ship. In this image, we can see the Graf Zeppelin just off the starboard side, the Franken, which was a huge cruise marine supply ship set of similar proportions. Here we've got the slipway where Graf Zeppelin was constructed. Next, the enormous floating dry dock in which the battleship Gneisenau now would be destroyed two years later in February 1942 when a single bomb penetrated the armoured deck while she was undergoing repairs for damage incurred on the Channel Dash. And in which, and in which we just saw Graf Zeppelin having those counterpoise bulges added in March 1943. In the same image, we can also see um, the Germania Verse shipyard, which in 1940 had already laid 10,000 tonnes of steel for Graf Zeppelin's sister ship. But even as this picture was being taken, they were already starting to dismantle her as the space and the steel were needed for other more pressing needs. And finally, at the bottom end of, of the harbour here, we can see Prince Eugen, which is just near in completion. She's not yet in service, but will be very soon. Taken during the period of the war known as the Phony War, this image shows Kiel before the wholesale bombing of towns and cities had begun. But this phase of the war would not last very long. I mean, between 1940 and 1944 alone, there were over 100 heavy raids on Kiel. And to get an idea of the carnage that Kiel would face in the years after 1940, let's take a minute to look at the two square docks in the upper left of this image. Here we see the area in 1940 before the bombing began, but by the end of the war, Kiel would be described as being in a state of indescribable chaos. Completely out of action, with 80 to 90 percent of buildings destroyed and every building having suffered damage. An estimated 167,000 people were homeless, and of the 10,000 employees who had worked at the shipyards, only a handful remained behind. If Graf Zeppelin wasn't to share the fate of Gneisenau now, and the 15,000 ton panzer ship Admiral Scheer, seen here capsized in the harbour in 1945, she would need to relocate again. 
The mere presence of such a big target draw unwanted attention from Allied bomber formations. And so it wasn't just for her own safety that she had to had to be moved. Let's remember there was people living in the city. And you know, back when Gneisenau was sunk in 1942, or when she was catastrophically damaged whilst in dry dock in 1942. She was attacked by 49 aircraft, all dropping multiple heavy bombs against her. And it was actually only one bomb that, that penetrated the armored deck. Most of the others fell on the city around. So there's a really sort of humanitarian uh, need to move the ship as well, I would say at this point. Gus would rejoin the ship for this penultimate journey to Poland and arriving at the ship, he recognized people from the gun crews who he'd made the previous journey with. With the threat of bomber attack at ever present, they probably didn't hang around once they decided that they were going to move her out. So Graf Zeckman, in this image, is preparing to make the sea. The crew are gathering for a final briefing before she get, once again heads out into the Baltic. On Graf Zeckman's bridge, here we see not navigation officers, she's after all on the tow, but these are gunnery officers present to keep a lookout for Allied aircraft attempting to attack. In the event of an attack, it would have been these guys that selected the targets for the gunners to engage. And it's interesting to note that here in the bridge, as with the images from the bakery we saw earlier, there are numbers painted on the steelwork, identifying the locations where instruments still needed to be added. Also, the bridge windows have no glass and are boarded up. The conditions were good for the crossing and relatively uneventful. And all in all, they had a pleasant time. So Gus did recall that early one dusky morning, short before they reached the River Oda, a four-engine bomber appeared out of the gloom, passing close by the ship. Some of the gun crews uh, took the opportunity to open fire. But the engagement was short-lived and no hits were recorded. Arriving on the Oda, Tugs pushed Graf Zeppelin into position on a deserted section of the river that would remain at home until the end of the war. Gus recalled that they had one last meal on board before being ordered to pack up, ready to leave the ship. And he recalled how wandering around the ship, he'd seen the propellers removed and left on deck in order to avoid um, a corrosion by electrolysis in the years that the ship had been stood, at, stood idle. The propellers would remain behind. However, as they packed up the gas cylinders for the barrage balloons, the anti-aircraft weapons, and thousands of rounds of ammunition were removed from the ship. And she was hidden under cam uh, camouflage netting. In the background on the horizon in this image, we could see um, the Vulcan shipyard in Stettin, a very famous shipyard. Whilst on a deck, we can see on the port side here, the four propellers. Here, we can see the position where Gus's weapon had been. It's already been removed, so it's likely he too has already departed the ship at this point. And then finally, here in the fore of the image, we can see a 3.7 centimetre flat gun pointing skyward in anticipation of attack, its crews and boxes of ammunition standing ready. Note that this weapon is trained to the west. Even at this point in the war, it must have seemed inconceivable that an attack would come um, from the east. And maybe some of you may have even seen actually in the news recently where the Polish Navy blew up. It was actually a tall boy bomb that was found not very far from this location. So by this point in the war, the whole area was within, you know, it was possible for Allied aircraft to get, to get there and to carry out a, a, um, an attack. After Gus left her in 1943, Graf Zeppelin would sit here unmolested for another two years. He, of course, knew that his other ship, Prince Eugen, met the fate as a result of an atomic bomb test far away on the other side of the world in 1946. What had become of Graf Zeppelin? He'd ultimately have to wait another 60 years to find out. And that's where I come into the story. This book, bought for me by my parents for Christmas 1999, first brought my attention to the Graf Zeppelin. The book claims she'd sunk on her way to Leningrad, now St. Petersburg, just after the war. And these few lines of text really connected with me. I'd, I'd read military books all my life and had never heard of the Graf Zeppelin. It was sort of mind blowing that such a big ship could have existed and I didn't know about her. I knew instantly when I saw this that I wanted to find her and dive her. I didn't believe that she'd just disappeared. I tracked down a great many historical documents in the National Archive in Kew, and I was able to discover that literally thousands of landings were made at a mock-up flight deck, complete with a work in a rest wire at, at an airstrip in Travemunder on the German Baltic coast. And we've seen in this presentation images of fighter aircraft being catapulted, similar, similar images of, of, of Stuka dive bombs being catapulted also. The truth is the Kriegsmen so very nearly had a functioning aircraft carrier. And as construction continued in 1940, she was on target for sailing as a companion with Bismarck, and how different things might have been had that happened. 
As we'll see shortly, the Royal Navy were more concerned about Graf Zeppelin being on the loose than they were Bismarck. In my book, Freedom to Seize the Story of Hitler's Aircraft Carrier, I postulate what might have happened had Bismarck and Graf Zeppelin sailed as a task force with Prince Eugen. And I come to the conclusion that we may well have uh, not just lost the battle cruiser Hod back in May 1941, but possibly the two shadowing cruisers which, which were trailing Bismarck, and also for, most likely the brand new battleship Prince of Wales as well, because of course that suffered damage in that engagement and also a series of malfunctions, which would have left a bit of a sitting target. Had it played out this way, this would have left Germany with a very powerful fleet prowl in the Atlantic. And perhaps more importantly, it would have forced the Royal Navy to send five elderly revenge class battleships to the South China Seas in time for Christmas 1941. Many of you will have at least heard of, or perhaps even dived the wrecks of Prince of Wales and Repulse, but few realise that the decision to send Prince of Wales was Churchill's. The Navy had originally wanted to send five revenge class, but Churchill wanted to show the Japanese that we were sending our most modern vessel. However, had Prince of Wales been lost to Bismarck or, or carrier aircraft in May 1941, they would have had little choice but to send these slow, outdated remnants from another era. And in all likelihood, all would have been lost to Japanese aircraft. Keeping in mind that we lost Barham and Art Royal also in that same year, who knows what impact such heavy losses could, you know, would have had on morale at home and, and the world to keep fighting. It would have been significant, I'd imagine. Many people these days dismiss Graf Zeppelin as offering no threat to the Allied cause, even if she had been completed. But evidence, would, evidence I would uncover in the archives demonstrated that she was for a time considered the biggest threat confronting the Royal Navy. It would be true to say that the Admiralty had grave concerns. And as we can see in this historical document, by the Navy's own admission, they had nothing with which to fight Graf Zeppelin. <clears throat> she was fast, being able to accelerate to 20 knots from the standing start in under two minutes and had a top speed of around 34 knots. She was also armed like a cruiser and operated much more modern aircraft than the Royal Navy's fleet air arm could muster. The document reads that it's the aircraft carrier Graf Zeppelin which is likely to provide our most disagreeable problem. If the ship accompanied by Bismarck or one of the Shannon Horse were to break out, we should have to be prepared for very serious depredations in our trade. In good weather, the aircraft carrier could reconnoitre some 20,000 square miles in one day and could hardly fail to locate some of our large convoys. Her reconnaissance would serve equally to defend the attackers from our hunting groups, and this power of evasion might enable raids to be pressed into the western approaches, our most vulnerable area. The conclusion is that Bismarck herself is not likely to prove the menace it would at first seem likely. It is the aircraft carrier which is going to turn the scales in favour of any raider. The enemy's best course of action would probably be to retain Bismarck at home to contain the maximum of our forces, and to send a shine horse with a carrier to the North Atlantic. To meet such a combination, and possibly a Deutschland in the South Atlantic, we ourselves should need every aircraft carrier, carrier that we could make available. Despite these fears, throughout the whole war, RAF Bomber Command only actioned one attack against Graf Zeppelin. Although early on other plans were discussed, including an attack proposed in 1940, to use fleet air arm torpedo bombers um, to take her out while she was still fitting out against the harbour wall in Kiel, in that image we saw previously. This was back in the days of the phony war, and so our bombing policy prevented the use of bomber aircraft over such heavily populated areas. So a torpedo attack was an obvious consideration. But the fleet air arms Pearl Harbour style attack would never be carried out due to the unacceptably high casualty rates expected amongst the air crews. However, on the night of the 27th, 28th of August, 1942, the ship was targeted after intelligence reports indicated that she was almost ready to sail and the crew were being taken on board. Perhaps knowledge of Gus and his companion's scheduled journey had leaked out. So while still moored in Gdynia, three RAF Lancaster bombers from 106 Squadron, led by Guy Gibson, who the following year would famously lead the bouncing bomb attack, which destroyed two dams and damaged a third, were dispatched, each carrying a new weapon, the 5,600 pound capital ship bomb, for which Graf Zeppelin was the, the, the trial target. But luckily for us divers, due to bad weather, all would miss. I was learning a lot about the ship and her wartime movements, but her fate was still a mystery. Some accounts said that she'd been completely broken for scrap, another outlandishly claimed that she, that she had secretly been commissioned into the Soviet Navy. Whilst my favourite and indeed one of the more plausible claims, appearing to corroborate that story about the ship being lost in the Gulf of Finland, elaborated that she'd struck a mine whilst under tow to Russia, 
and was apparently loaded with cargo of vehicles and U-boat parts. What an awesome dive that would have been. But what was the truth? It would take me two years of research to, to establish this. I joined the British Tobacco Club when I was around 10 years old as a junior snorkeler, because back then you had to be 14 before they'd let you learn to dive. But I was keen as mustard and I loved snorkeling. I loved the snorkeling club. And ultimately I ended up involved for over 25 years with it, even running it with my wife Sharon for more than a decade. I've dived now for over 32 years, completing my introduction to diving course with Warrington's branch, the Warrington branch of the British Tobacco Club in November 1988, right after I turned 14. Council state lad, I was skint and I had to beg and borrow to get my first lot of diving equipment. But diving was and very much still is the thing I live for. The British Tobacco Club, and more specifically the guys and girls at Warrington Tobacco Club, opened a door to a wealth of people and experiences that, that absolutely shaped my life. I didn't have a background of researching wrecks or writing books. I was just an ordinary guy like all of you, you know, are on here listening today. And even today, I wouldn't claim to have the kudos of many of the great divers that, that we all probably know and we read about. I just had a dream. And that dream wasn't for treasure. It was to fulfill a desire to find a wreck of my very own. And a Nazi aircraft carrier over a quarter of a kilometre long, I figured had to be an easy target, right? By the time I got that book at Christmas 1999, I already had 11 years experience under my belt. And I'd already been lucky enough to have many adventures such as this one. Um, this image being from the mid 1990s, where I'm part of a small team salvaging a Dutch East Indian off the coast of Shetland. I was having a lot of fun back then. I've always loved history, um, and that was actually one of my big draws to diving. Um, I think I've always been a wreck diver at heart. It's never really been about fish for me. It's always been about the wrecks and the, and the stories. I suppose I, I like the stories as well. But I never really thought of myself as, as a historian or a researcher, although I suppose in some ways that's what I've always been. Research into Graf Zeppelin would leave my, di leave my diving career down the technical diving route and to ever greater depths as I realised the likely depth Graf Zeppelin was, was going to be lying in. And looking back, this was both scary and an exciting time for me. And of you technical divers out there, who were active back in the early 2000s, maybe you can remember just how deep even 60 metres seemed. Um, and for those of you who haven't been 60 metres, well, I suppose it still seems quite deep, and it is really. But I can remember the butterflies I felt heading out to one or two sites in this type of depth. I suppose things are, are probably not bat an eyelid at now. Um, but at the time, it was really stomach churning stuff for me, all the time suspecting that Graf Zeppelin might lie in double the depth, 120 metres. Graf Zeppelin also introduced me to computers and the internet. And literally never used a computer until a World War II aircraft carrier pretty much forced me to learn. My first ever internet search would be on the brand new Google, and my first search topic was Graf Zeppelin. And I had to actually remember typing in, hello, I'm looking for information on, and the chap who was sat next to me telling me what to do burst out laughing, I, I didn't have a clue. But at this, I would join just 5% of the global population to be online. So to put this into context, 5% was 300 million people all globally or less than 20% of Facebook users today. Early on, the research was especially hard going. Even being an internet user now, there was still a lot of legwork to do. I was totally new to this, but the internet definitely enhanced the learning process. Back then I was devouring books as well. I don't seem to get the time these days, but then I was a man on a mission. All I lived and breathed Graf Zeppelin. I learned that the ship's keel was laid in December, 1936. as part of a plan to greatly scale up German naval power. And the design would include quadruple steam turbines, the only ship in the German fleet to have this feature. Even a sister ship wouldn't have, wouldn't have quadruple turbines. Thousands of tons of steel was cut and put into place. And she, you know, she quickly started to tower up over keel. Here we see a built up to the armoured deck. And it's said that Graf Zeppelin's proposed sister ship was about this level of completion when she was scrapped. An incredible 10,000 tons of steel having been laid, an enormous amount of work having been carried out, all for nothing. The build progressed quickly and she would be launched less than two years after the keel had been laid. Enormous feat, I think. And the daughter of the creator of the Zeppelin rigid airship, Ella von Brandstein Zeppelin, christened the ship in order of the father in the presence of Hitler, Grand Admiral Rader, and Hermann Goering, head of the Luftwaffe. And Goering himself would give a speech in which he declared, Freedom of the seas is only for the strong. And from which I took the title of my second book. 
Immediately after the launch, she was taken to the fitting out key to have her construction completed. As you're probably aware, ships get launched, when they launch a ship, usually the engines and things like that are not in place, it's just as a weight saving. So obviously there's a lot of structures still to be added and we can see that work going on here. And I like this picture for many reasons. One, it looked busy, you can see things going on. But also when we zoom in closer, there's just a lot of detail. So if we look here, we can see the, bridge, the windows on the bridge haven't been cut out yet. Okay, they're marked out in chalk, but they're still there. And here, a little bit further forward, the presence of a 3.7 centimetre anti-aircraft gun into, indicates that this is early on in the war and that they're fearful of an attack. Rightly so, because we were planning a torpedo attack. But the thing that I like the best is this chap here, apparently sitting on the toilet talking to his pal. Of course, they needed port loose even back then, didn't they? So who knew that over 80 years later, we'd all be sitting here watching, and hopefully having a laugh at the guy. I also like that the three largest Kriegsmarine units were still able to dive in Europe today are present in this one image. Clearly, Graf Zeppelin domineers the image and is in the fore. But off the stern, we've got the heavy cruiser Blucher here just fitting out and completing. And the Kriegsmarine supply ship Franken. The fate of the other ships was well known. The 18,500 tonne Blucher was lost during the invasion of Norway, sinking with great loss of life on the approach to Oslo. And if you have the chance to go and relevant qualifications and I suppose are mad enough, she is an absolutely fantastic dive, um, but challenging, very challenging. She lies upside down in over 90 metres of water and underneath a very busy shipping lane. So if you were to plan some kind of expedition to go, I'd strongly recommend hooking up with someone who's at least been before so they can show you the ropes and what to do. The 23,000 tonne Kriegsmarine supply ship Franken would almost survive the war but was sunk by Soviet aircraft just off the Hell Peninsula in April 1945. Issue 2 is a fantastic dive. And I only got to dive both of these vessels basically because they failed Graf Zeppelin expeditions. And that was great fun all in itself, but you know, the mystery was still there, what had become of Graf Zeppelin? She seemed to have just disappeared from the moan, a branch of the river over just outside Stettin. All that anyone was certain about was that she'd been abandoned there in 1943. Now, whilst researching in the archives, the internet, and by many niche publications, I learned how in April 1945, the Soviet troops approached Stettin, German demolition crew went on board, led by Captain Wolfgang Kahler, the former captain of Gneisenau. Explosive charges ripped throughout the ship and detonated. The blast decimated in the turbine rooms, electrical installations, and almost inverted her elevators, like we see here. Numerous perforations of the hull caused her to sink, but with only half a metre under a keel, the sinking was very undramatic. And to the casual observer, it would have gone unnoted. But then this is where the story went cold. That is until I decided to write to the Russian embassy in London, who in turn would guide me to a Russian archive just outside Moscow. But remember, this time predates Google Translate even. And so even just getting a letter translated into Russian and sent to Moscow was a bit of a task in itself. I had to find a Russian language college course and, and attend one of their classes, which was sort of stereotypically full of basically aging Marxist men. And uh, I'd never really anticipate getting a reply, if I'm honest with you. Um, don't forget this was barely 10 years after the Cold War had ended. So I was genuinely surprised when I came home from work one day to find mum holding an envelope stamped as cleared by the Foreign Office and with Russian writing all over it, asking what on earth I was up to. I seriously think she thought I was joining the KGB. You see, I was just some kid from a council estate in Warrington, so it raises a few eyebrows when you get official letters from Moscow, it really did. But joking aside, I, I of course, for quite some time sat with this letter, and you can probably see if you take a look there, there's some coordinates in it. So I figured something of the shit still existed, which was a result, let's say, because some of the stuff we've been reading was that it had just been scrapped. But what condition was she in? I didn't know. Um, you know, there's obviously still more research to do. But the letter did turn out to be absolute gold dust because it described how she'd been disposed of as part of a tripartite agreement between Great Britain, the US and Russia to seek German naval assets in water over 100 metres deep. Effectively, it was, part, it was a Soviet version of Operation Deadline in which we, the British, had sunk over 100 surrendered U-boats in the years following World War II. And somebody might have died them off island. I, of course, immediately checked out the position and discovered that if she'd sunk where the Russians stated, then she was indeed in 120 metres of water. But I'm a bit of an optimist, so I pressed on. 
Not deterred, and armed with this information, I would continue to research the ship. Later still, I would learn more details of the weapons test that the Soviets conducted on it. I'd even find pictures from a, a, a Russian magazine that, that, that had appeared. Some observers point to the increasing tension between Russia and a bomber allies in the West, and the obvious point the US, and to a lesser degree the UK, operated a lot of aircraft carriers. By the end of World War II, we were operating 60 vessels that, that were capable of carrying aircraft. Vessels which in any future conflict the Soviets would need to deal with. So the experience gained here might, you know, might benefit them. But to be honest, if the Russians learned one thing during the sinking of Graf Zeppelin, it must surely have been that they were not likely to come away with much glory from any such encounters. Because by all accounts, thank God, the test didn't go completely to plan. And Graf Zeppelin ended up drifting for rather quite a long time, with a huge vertical steel size acting as a sail, which had covered quite a distance. Once I had the exact date it should sunk, another breakthrough came, for, came after I decided to write to the Meteorological Office, the UK's National Weather Service. We were able to locate the weather forecast for the day Graf Zeppelin sunk. From this, I was able to work out the direction she drifted, and for the first time in my life, used trigonometry for something that I found worthwhile. From this particular image, I was able to make a crude calculation, and I was able to ascertain that to achieve the angle that the ship is at here, assuming she's not snapped somehow, she had to be in water circa 90 metres deep. But if she drifted from that over that trench, which was 120 metres deep, the water rapidly became shallower. So it meant I was able to have a pretty damn good guess as to where she would end up lying. And so in 2006, I travelled to Sweden to charter a boat. And the plan was I was going to return 2007 to cross the Baltic to find and dive Graf Zeppelin. But no sooner had I arrived home in the UK and a friend texted me the news that an aircraft carrier had been found in the Baltic, barely half a mile away from where I suspected she would be, keeping in mind that this ship was quarter of a kilometre long, certain I was going to find her. It was immediately apparent it was Graf Zeppelin. And I was, of course, more than a little disappointed that someone had beaten me to it. But if I'm honest, I could live with being beaten to my goal by a high-tech survey vessel. My worry was genuinely always that it was going to be some bloke in a rib that, that just blasted out there and found it. Um, and besides, I'd just published my first book, Without Wings, so the, the news greatly helped with the sales. It even got me my first invite to be a guest speaker to the 2007 Belgian Dive Show. And I was bricking it. I'd never done any public speaking before. But at this event, it was very worthwhile, I had a fabulous time, and I met a lot of people who would greatly influence the next decade of my life. Also, it leads me to leave my job and go on a completely different tangent. Very quickly following the discovery of the wreck, some amazing images of the ship were in the media, and it was immediately clear that she was largely intact, but that there was a large hole in the flight deck. This fitted with contemporary descriptions of a sinking, and it's likely that a 1,000 kilogram bomb detonated on Graf Zeppelin's flight deck during a phase of testing known as the static test, ripped the enormous hole there. I'd learned that she was also subsequently attacked by aircraft, which dropped 150 kilogram bombs, but embarrassingly only six were recorded as having hit the ship, though aircrew claimed a further five disappeared into that large hole blown in the deck. Either way, I think a bit of an embarrassing tally for a ship that was standing still and not shooting back. After this round of attacks, the ship endured a series of torpedo attacks, though some of these missed as they ran too deep, and those that did hit exploded against the counterpoise bulges on the starboard side, this doing exactly what it was supposed to do, and dissipating the force of the blast, sparing the ship from any serious damage. With the ship increasingly drifting into shallower water, additional support was called in, and a torpedo fired by the destroyer Slavny penetrated the ship just in the area approximately forward of the elevator. And quickly, the carrier dipped by the bows, began to increasingly list the starboard, sinking in under 25 minutes. From the news report, I'd get the name of a Polish naval officer, Adam Oleshnik, seen here on the left, so I wrote to him asking for information about the wreck site, and as with so many people I contacted out of the blue throughout my research, he was as helpful as any guy could be. Adam and I would exchange a lot of emails and very quickly became good friends, even though I spoke very little Polish and he sort of speaks very little English. He does all right, but we, we struggle at times. And he, he would offer to provide me some material for um, a second book, which obviously I was really keen to see. I would end up travelling to meet Adam in 2008, and we would agree that he would contribute a chapter to the new book, Freedom of the Seas. And, it, and he would write about the discovery and exploration of the website. 
Gus would survive the war and I would travel to Austria to meet him in 2009. And he would share his amazing story with us. And with the help of Belgian cameraman Danny Huyger, who I'd met at the Belgian dive show a couple of years before, we would interview Gus on camera and he would share his story. In his mid-80s at the time, he was incredibly lucid and still very active. In 2011, I arranged for Gus to come to the UK to take part in an episode of the BBC series Coast, remembering the 70th anniversary of the Channel Dash. And after the filming, we toured London together, and I took him to see another World War II veteran, HMS Belfast. But he was thoroughly unimpressed, commenting that Prince Eugen was much bigger and he bought a much better looking ship. And if I'm honest, I'm inclined to agree with him. Whilst he was in the UK, he obviously visited the Imperial War Museum in London, and he was greeted there by the curator, who offered to conduct a private tour, asking if he'd ever seen this image of Prince Eugen. And Gus's answer was brilliant, because he said, seen it, I'm in it. Because when Gus on through the English Channel on Prince Eugen and joined the Channel, that's his position was here, right on the bow of this flat gun installed especially for the journey. And to my mind, this is one of, one of, if not the most iconic images to come out of the Kriegsmarine during World War II. And Gus is there in the middle of it. In the years following the ship's discovery, I would try and fail to dive Graf Zeppelin on multiple occasions. Once driving from the UK, over, in fact, more than once driving all the way from the UK, but literally to get within 20 miles of Gdynia when the expedition was cancelled due to bad weather. I had originally got the backing of a National Geogra Geographic documentary produced in 2009 to make a documentary about her. However, before long, this was cancelled as a result of the global banking crisis. But I would get my chance to dive Graf Zeppelin and my time on camera in 2017, when no less than three TV companies, all independently but all at the same time, approached me about Graf Zeppelin. First came Der Spiegel, the German channel. And they would come to my house just for a straightforward interview. They'd interview me in my living room. This was aired in Germany and Italy later that year. Next, National Geographic would contact me, and I would have a lot of involvement with Crispin Sadler's excellent team seen here producing an episode of Drain the Oceans on location in Poland. It was a lot of fun. And I must admit to getting a bit of a buzz was seeing my smiling mug was used to advertise the series all over the world. And I think I still am on, on, on if you see me on. I think I'm on the Disney Channel or something now. Finally, Canal Plus, the Polish TV channel, would also contact me. And before long, I'd be heading back to Poland again. As part of the Canal Plus documentary, I would get to join Tomasz Dottora of Santi Dry Suits and his team on a dive to the wreck site. And the following images of the wreck come courtesy of the Polish Navy, Tomasz Dottora, Marek Tsiachaj and Łukasz Piorowicz. On the day, we landed on the wreck on the flight deck next to the superstructure. And while waiting for the team to assemble, I had a bit of time to explore. The visibility was fantastic, albeit a tad dark, as it tends to be in the Baltic though, if ever you've been. It was very atmospheric, I thought. And as you can imagine, I was a very happy diver by this point. Once our little group was all present, we immediately headed towards the bow. And the wreck's at quite an extreme angle, being around 45 degrees over starboard. And at times it was difficult to gauge the attitude of my own body in relation to the ship beneath me, resulting in me twisting unnaturally as I tried to swim over the deck. Um, I was sort of trying to swim as if she was on an even keel, but it was, it was really quite difficult. And for those of you who have not made a documentary before, especially an underwater documentary, it's a strange thing, because you're bathed in the brightest lights imaginable pretty much throughout the full dive. And here I am, this is me, the focus of the image here, looking at the ammunition hoist and the forward 10.5 centimetre anti-aircraft guns, all the try time trying not to look too far to my left for fear of being blinded by the light. We next headed up the sloping flight deck and over to the port side um, of the ship and into the rebate in which the catapult would have been located. From here we dropped off the flight deck and onto the bow several metres below us. The focus of the dive was the forward one third of the ship, and the scale was just, just something else, it is enormous. And the distance between sections of interest was deceptively far. I was keen to get to the bow, as I was always intrigued by the sonar image of the wreck, which Adam had produced when, they, when the Polish Navy first surveyed the site. And I was intrigued as to how the bow appears to be missing. Had this collapsed, I wondered, you know, what, what had caused that? But well, having spoken to numerous divers who've dived the wreck over the years, all of them absolutely insisted that the bow was present. But Adam Olesnik insisted it couldn't be, or it would have shown on the sonogram. He was absolutely adamant. And the truth, it turned out, is somewhere in between. 
The bounce covered in a lot of net, and though largely present, I can see where the confusion had come from. If you're not paying attention, the bow does indeed appear to be intact. But on closer inspection, it's clear that the bow should have continued for another meter or two from the end of the netting in this image. The forward facing horse and absolute nose of the ship being absent, as is some of the steelwork below this area. In this image from 1940, we see the ship's so-called Atlantic bow being added retrospectively after the launch. And today, this, the bow area kind of looks like it does here, minus the scaffolding, of course. Zooming in at the waterline, I was actually able to look back into the ship and see the ship's internal frames, just as you can see them here. And there was also signs of some kind of small explosion, perhaps one of the 50 kilogram bombs dropped by the um, aircraft during a weapons test had, had caused some damage. Maybe this is one of the hits of the pilot's plane, which they were denied. We then headed back up onto the foredeck and we would swim along the bow and under the overhang of the flight deck where we came across Graf Zeppelin's enormous anchor chains. And of course, I think when anyone sees big anchor chains, you've got to do that, haven't you? Uh, any footage you see of people on the Graf Zeppelin over the anchors, they'll always end up putting their hand up against the, the, the chain, as did I. And they're pretty huge. But we saw no sign of the anchors, um, perhaps because, as was claimed by some contemporary reports, the German demolition team severed these back in 1945. But when you dive in Graf Zeppelin, many areas do actually feel, feel unfinished. The bow area definitely felt uh, very functional, with all the normal shipboard features. There was bollards and cleats, capstans, if perhaps somewhat all supersized on what we used to see on wrecks. Having had a mooch around in this area, we headed out over the top of that handrail there and um, entered the forward casemates, the guns having been removed in 1940. And the guns are still in existence, actually. You can go see them in museums. Intended to house the twin 15 centimetre artillery pieces, entering these spaces it is impressive. I don't think the contemporary images really do the scale justice. This area is pretty huge. And I remember seeing an, an access here to Sea Deck from, I obviously kind of got the, the layout of the ship pretty well memorised, and I was really, really tempted just to disappear through and head off and do a little bit of exploring. But of course, I had a camera crew in the train, so I had to respect them somewhat, and so we had to stick with the plan. And besides, time was pressing on. The scale of the case which only really hit home as we turned to leave. And I was again confronted by this wall of light from the, the camera crew outside waiting to you know, capture me exiting um, the barbette. And turning to exit, I recalled the newsreel footage of Graf Zeppelin's launch and the many people standing in this, in this exact location, just metres away from Hitler, giving the, the Hitler salute directly to their Führer. And from this point, we would descend up the side of the ship towards the flight deck. As we ascended, we passed the officer's mess, and as we approached the flight deck level, an opportunity came our way, recognising exactly where I was on the ship, and noticing the platform in the extreme right of this image here, just jutting out into the darkness, I decided to go and pay a visit to the scene of these first colour images that came from the wreck during Adam's survey um, of the ship shortly after she was located in 2006. To me, these images, which appeared in, 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 in both books, actually, um, were a big part of the Graf Zeppelin story, and it made sense to stop by and just see the specific, specific location for myself. And though the weapons were long since removed from this gun mount, there was still a real atmosphere there, and I could still, I could still visualise Gus Comrade's man in this exact position back in 1943. I also immediately recognised the ammunition lock here and we recalled how Adam had created some stunning 3D images of the area. We then headed um, down and across the 30 metre wide flight deck, descending to the superstructure and the bridge area on the starboard side of the ship. And this was perhaps to be the most moving part the point of the dives. I knew we were nearing the end and I was feeling privileged to be here. And you might recognise this particular location here. This is the exact spot where those black officers were standing in that image from the ship from 1943 when she was in transit to the moon. And I'd long since wanted to stand on this spot. I very much felt that this was my ship and I wanted to be commander of my ship and stand on the bridge. But when I got there, there was sort of a lot of net, if I'm honest with you, and I figured I would just settle for hovering over it. We'd get an opportunity to investigate around the superstructure, including around the starboard side, which is the lower side of the ship which actually projects out over the side of the hull, 
remember it's aircraft carriers are not symmetrical so it was to it was it was offset so as to aid navigation and also just allow the flight deck to be a little bit wider than it otherwise would have been in this image here leaning up against the wall we can see what looks like the remains of a steel bed frame but though there's a lot of random pieces of equipment still on the ship many items are unrecognizable behind the bridge we would see the void where the rangefinder for the naval artillery was to have been located and the tower for the anti-aircraft gun rangefinders before arriving at what was left of the funnel. Keeping in mind a 1,000 kilogram bomb was detonated inside the funnel, the whole area is way more recognisable than I'd expected. We crossed the area, stopping to peer down into uh, the void beneath a section of deck that was curiously, curiously exposed here, before returning to the shot line to make our ascent. As with all great dives, the time in the bottom seemed too short and the time in the deco seemed too long. As I made my ascent, I kept my eyes glued on the wreck until she disappeared into the gloom. And for those of you who've not dived the Baltic, decompression can be a strange thing to say the least. Lacking any tidal flow, the shot lines have a tendency to be somewhat limp. It can float around lazily as there's no tide to take attention. We had amazing visibility on the dive. Well, as is common in this bit of the world, there was no day there was no daylight on the bottom, so it was very dark. And then on the on the ascent, visibility det deteriorated due to an algae bloom. So it was wise to say kind of close to the shot, though to be honest, I wasn't going to drift off anywhere because there's, there's, there's no tide. Once back on the surface, there was a mood of elation, and the camera team from Canal Plus were waiting for me as I broke the surface. So finally, after so many years. Excellent. After nearly 20 years of trying to get to this site, I genuinely hadn't let myself believe this would be the day until not only had we splashed, but starting to make the descent, I figured that once on the but until starting to make the descent, I figured that once on the descent, literally nothing was going to stop me. On returning to the surface, I felt a sense of achievement, but also relief that I'd finally fulfilled the dream. So I really didn't think it was going to happen until it did. We'd initially hoped to get a couple of dives on the wreck, but as with all the best dive documentaries, the weather was closing in and we had to get back into port, not to venture out on this trip, not to venture out again on this trip. I do, of course, still desperately want to go back to Graf Zeppelin. I, was, I think it's an awesome wreck. I was, in, I was invited along to a 2021 uh, 20, well, expedition back to the site, but I think we can all probably figure out how that's going to pan out. Um, there's many areas I still want to explore. For example, Gus gun position and his quarters on board, and then I have questions about the technology that was used on board. Namely, where did it go? Where, for example, did her catapults go? We've got photographic evidence that they were installed, but on the wreck, gone. Were these removed by the Soviet Union for, for evaluation, I wondered? Did they utilize this or similar tech on future warships? Also on the dive with Thomas and his team, we were, we, as we were returning to the shot, we passed over that hole in the flight deck here. Not bomb damage, I'm certain this is the access hatch to a boiler rooms. And peering in, I could see that the deck below was similarly uncovered as well. If nothing else, this will provide excellent access to a Graf Zeppelin class boiler room. But why were these accesses removed, I wondered? Were they removed to allow Soviet divers to access the boiler rooms to carry out repair work when they were trying to raise her from the moan? Or maybe they'd um, remove some of the Graf Zeppelin's boilers for evaluation. Only further exploration will allow us to, to, to know for sure. Video footage of other dive expeditions on the wreck site similarly appears to show at least one of the access hatches under the catapults to be exposed in this area. This provided access to the forward mounted void propellers. In this image from, from 2010, I wasn't on this expedition, unfortunately. But this large square access hole is clearly visible under the flight deck. And is in about the correct location to the access for the insertion and removal of one of the voices. Graf Zeppelin had two of these ingenious devices to aid navigation in confined waters. And she was able to provide, these were able to provide thrust from 360 degrees. They could be lowered out of the bell housing in the keel to provide thrust to the bow in any direction at speeds of up to 12 knots. They could also be used to move her on their own at speeds up to four knots. But if my suspicions are correct, at least one of these was removed prior to her sinking. Circumstantial evidence from just three years after Graf Zeppelin was sunk would suggest that the technology was used on a new Soviet warship, the cruiser Sverdlov. Launched in 1950 and known to have superior maneuverability to other ships at the time, 
The famous uh, wartime diver Buster Crabbe would secretly sur survey the hull in 1955 when Sir Sverdlov um, visited Portsmouth Harbour on a goodwill mission. And on that dive, he found a circular opening in the ship's bow, and inside it, a large propeller that could be lowered to give thrust um, to the bow. And I can't help but think that this was technology that the, the, the Russians stole from Hitler's aircraft carrier. I had a fantastic couple of decades researching the Graf Zeppelin. I wrote two books about her and tried and failed to dive on many, many occasions before finally achieving the success that I'd set out to gain all those years before. But even out of the adversity came a lot of improvement. And on reflection, it's the amazing people that I met and who helped me on the journey and the strong friendships I had formed that ultimately brought me the greatest satisfaction. I never appreciated this at the time, but looking back, as Ralph Waldo Emerson is credited with saying, life is a journey, not a destination. And I kind of think that my journey began in 1988 when I completed my introduction to diving course with the British Tobacco Club that certainly opened all the doors for me. Throughout this whole adventure, a great many people helped me, including my wife, Sharon, who gave me such a free hand. I travelled all over Europe constantly, uh, meeting people and interviewing people, collecting the information I needed. My brother, Joseph, who translated so many documents for me. I'm not a German speaker, so I needed, I needed help from someone. Uh, Francis Marshall, author of the definitive book about the BF 109T fighter aircraft intended for Graf Zeppelin, Sea Eagles. Francis would introduce me to authors Richard Wagner and Manfred Bilsk, who built this fantastic one to 100 scale model of Graf Zeppelin and published an excellent book about it as well. And it was Manfred who introduced me to August. Also, I owe a massive thank you to Danny Goiger, Belgian cameraman extraordinaire, who without this, I think none of it would have happened. Um, he, he was a massive influence for me. Commander Adam Alejnik, the Polish Navy, museum curator and archivist all over the world who give their time for free and help. Resources such as the Bundes Archive, the Smithsonian Institute and the Imperial War Museum. And also, of course, Thomas Dutour and his team, who ultimately enabled me to fulfil my dream and provided most of the photos of the wreck that I've shared with you today. And of course, let's not forget August Brunmeier. I, for one, never thought that I would count not just one 90 odd year old man as a good friend, but several of them. The time I spent with various Creedsmen and veterans was fantastic and changed my outlook on life. Gus lived long enough to know I'd dive Graf Zeppelin, and I'd have the pleasure of sharing the old Kriegsmarine veteran's last boat trip on a lake near his alpine home of Gossau. What an amazing guy Gus was. So um, I've overrun a little bit, guys. I, I, I should have had about 50 minutes to share this brief insight into the Graf Zeppelin story. But if you're interested in uh, learning a bit more about the ship and the aircraft that were to have been on border, the full story is available here in my book, Freedom of the Seas, the story of Hitler's aircraft carrier Graf Zeppelin. The book includes more than 150 images and a fold-out set of shipyard plans. In the book, Gus shares his story of his time on board Graf Zeppelin, and Adam Alejnik shares his memories of the initial survey of the wreck site and his part in the discovery and reawakening of Hitler's Baltic giant in 2006. If you'd like to get a copy of your own, I'm on, for today I'm offering a 15% discount. Just simply private message me, tell me he's on the call. Um, on, on Facebook, um, if you can search my page, which is the Aircraft Carrier Graf Zeppelin, or just search at Graf Zeppelin Books, and I'll get you a copy of the books to you. That's it.